Chief, talk about your call to action 17 months ago and how this event today plays into that. Well, perhaps um, helping to reflect that uh, maybe we're at a tipping point in Canada's history. That uh, as the words that we've heard from um, very influential thinkers like John Ralston Saul, that uh, he calls in his words that the, the funding situation for schooling is a scandal in this country. I think more and more Canadians are recognizing that we've all inherited a, a, a terrible past that is not serving anyone right now when we've got uh, less than 50% of uh, the fastest growing population in Canada, that is First Nations young people, um, graduating at a rate uh, below, well below that of, of the Canadian standards, receiving resources anywhere from two to $7,000 less per learner. Uh, but more importantly, that we're robbing ourselves of the human potential uh, by not making sure that those young people are supported. So I am actually very hopeful because of Nipissing University holding an event like this. But I'm also hopeful and, and I'm, I'm um, encouraged that Canadians and the governments are beginning to recognize and starting to talk with us about how we might bring about a major transformation in, in education systems and supports for First Nations learners. Has that sort of come about as a result of your call to action what, oh, well over a year ago now? Well, the, the call for First Nations control of First Nations education is really a 30-year effort. It's been three decades, and so I think it's the culmination of many leaders over, over many decades. Uh, the, the encouragement of the grandparents and families like mine saying make education a top priority. My late grandmother said, you know, we as First Nations are fighters. Uh, we raise our kids to be fighters. Now we don't fight our fight with our fists any longer. We fight our fight with education. And so I believe education is the way to transform our communities, to lift ourselves out of poverty and improve relationships between First Nations and the rest of Canada. So today, uh, you know, is this isn't the start of the, the dialogue, but is, is this the start of the, the formula? Well, we, we, uh, we're very hopeful that when we have uh, significant uh, university leadership like here at Nipissing by the President and by the Chancellor and, and uh, you know, major influencers joining us in this call to action, that we are achieving, um, you know, a, uh, um, we are realizing a, sig a significant moment because uh, we do need a major transformational change. We need we need, and the government agrees, that they should vacate the responsibility for education for First Nations. Let's place this in the hands of the education experts, the likes of which I met earlier today at the Anish Anishinaabek Nation office uh, right here um, in, um, in North Bay in uh, Nipissing. And uh, we have the educators who, who, with the supports, with the empowerment, with the tools necessary that they can bring about the kind of success in our learners that, that we so deeply desire. Now it's about uh, making sure that we bring about that major transformation and that uh, we look to the federal government to walk with us. And so I am encouraged and I'm hopeful that they will do exactly that. When you look at that, there's uh, that component out at uh, the head offices that uh, there is the curriculum and, and that doesn't change. That is a standard across the board for, for anyone. But you also have the uh, invitation of elders to help with that process. Is that what you're looking for? Is that balance of, uh, I guess, cultural and curriculum? Well, to think that when the Prime Minister rose in the House of Commons in the summer of 2008 and apologized for a policy under the guise of education through the residential schools, uh, which became a tool to pull people apart uh, from their families, their language, their culture. Um, building on that, uh, that important apology, we can suggest that in this new area of reconciliation, that education now be the tool to ensure that learners are supported in their languages, uh, to listen and learn from the elders, to remain connected to their nations, but at the same time, achieve a world-class education so that they can compete in a, in a modern economy. Um, looking forward, Canada is going to need uh, the youthfulness of the First Nations population. The mainstream population uh, is made up of aging baby boomers uh, who are vacating the workplace. And so uh, this is where Canada can find their labour market. And so it's a matter of looking to First Nations as the economic future of Canada. What's good for First Nations is going to be good for Canada. You call this an all-hands-on-deck exercise. What did you mean by that? Well, that all segments of, of Canada can join in, in this call to action. Um, not only the senior leadership here at Nipissing, but every single student uh, that participates. Uh, we know that learners in an in a institution like Nipissing are not just um, human capital for a market economy, but can be actors in a more civil society. 
And that means learning about the reasons why we have the conditions that we have, why we have the gap of misunderstanding we do between First Nations and the rest of Canada, and do something about it. And so we don't need to just leave it up to the decision makers in Ottawa, or even the executive suites in a university like Nipissing, that in fact that we can collectively say, yes, we are all treaty people. None of us created the Indian Act, nor did any of us open up those residential schools. But we can all share in finding a resolution that will enrich not only ourselves, our lives, but also enrich the economic potential of our communities and of the country. You know, you just keep throwing things out there to make people and help people to understand what's going on and what needs to go on. And uh, enormous progress has been made. I mean, I think this is the thing that's just not said enough, that uh, you look at where things were 40 years ago, you know, and then you say lawyers, and then you look over there and you see there are thousands of Aboriginal lawyers and there are 60 judges or whatever, and the number of doctors, the number of engineers, business leaders, or whatever. I mean, I've, I've spoken at the national meetings of m most of the you know, medical, legal, business, etc. Aboriginal leaders, and you look out there, and, and this is the second point, um, you see this really exciting new leadership. So if, if you say, well, what does that mean? Well, if I had to compare the Aboriginal leadership of today with anything, I'd say it's, it's like the uh, Quebecers in the 1960s. And you had these young Francophones who were really, really mad, with really good reasons to be mad, and they were lean, and they were hungry, they had a lot of good ideas, and they wanted to change everything, and they were going to work like mad to change everything. Well, that's the Aboriginal, young Aboriginal leadership of today, and that's come out of the success stories of getting, getting things in place. But now, and I think that's the point of the National Chiefs Initiative, is now we're at a stage where, on the one hand, there's this really fast growth, but on the other hand, the numbers are well below national averages. And there just needs to be an acceptance by everybody of the fact that we need to just uh, put a lot more money into it, open things up, make sure that the Aboriginal point of view is available to Aboriginals in a major way. And then I think secondly, make sure that the Aboriginal point of view is built into, and this is a separate issue, is built into broad Canadian education so that all Canadians understand A, how much they owe, and B, how interesting this is and how helpful this is. When you do look at that, uh, the investment in Aboriginal education versus uh, the mainstream, it, it's like two classes of citizens here. Um, you know, what do you do to change that? Well, it, you know, it, it really isn't that complicated. The fact that you have this incredible new Aboriginal elite shows you that it's really just a matter of resources. It's really just a matter of putting things in place in the right way. With, uh, Aboriginals know how to, the leadership knows what the right way is. And you'll triple, you'll quadruple that elite. And suddenly you'll be saying, why are they doing so much better than everybody else? So it's being artificially held back at the moment by the lack of money and by this sort of false view that the right way to do education is uh, something which is derivative of Europe. And we know, frankly, we know that, that there are enormous problems in what is called mainstream education because we're stuck in ways that were put in place early in the 20th century. Here comes a, a whole other approach to education, which on the one hand is traditional, um, but on the other hand, it's true to this place. And thirdly, frankly, in many cases, it's far more modern. I mean, you take, say, something like the environment. Aboriginal, traditional philosophical approaches to the environment 